church and I'm so pumped that you're here and by your silence I feel like you're not excited so we're going to start worship over again and uh, Danny's going to come back and sing let's do six more songs Daniel maybe that'll get us primed no I'm just kidding Uh, we're not going to do that if you have your bible go ahead and open them up to Exodus that's the second book of the scriptures Genesis Exodus Uh, No shame in looking up in your table of contents if you've got to. My page is page 60. Tyler and I have the same Bible, so get to page 60, bro. And uh, we'll be there in a minute. 61, sorry. But um, anyway, uh, Exodus chapter 10. uh, And we are in the 8th and ninth plague uh, here, uh, to which all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let me just give a precursor before you, while you're turning, before we get into the actual sermon. Next week, we are going to uh, celebrate the Passover. Uh, which is in Exodus, we're going to do 11 and 12. um, And so we're going to also take communion that day. Uh, And so you guys are going to want to be a part of that. So make sure, get here, uh, and we're going to celebrate as a church. We're going to walk through uh, the elements of uh, what communion is and the first Passover that ever happened, that which obviously paints or foreshadows the second Passover, which is Jesus Jesus Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection. So it's going to be a great Sunday next Sunday. Uh, and it's going to pack a pretty big punch uh, as far as the content goes. So God's word is going to be super clear. But for today, we're going to jump into Exodus chapter 10. It was 18, It was in the 1870s, and there she was, a little girl, uh, and she was sitting on the bank of Plum Creek. And she was playing with the blades of grass in between her bare feet with her toes. You ever done that before? And uh, she was sitting there minding her own business and listening to the birds chirp and listening to this creek just babble through and the water rushing. And then before she knew it, she felt this plop. And it fell on top of her head, scattered down her dress and onto the ground. And she looked in the eyes, the ugliest, the biggest, and the scariest grasshopper that she had ever seen. Huge, huge grasshopper. Before she knew it, Laura tells in her story on the banks of Plum Creek, which is a series in the autobiographical novel series, Little House, which is where we get our story, Little House on the Prairie. And she tells of these grasshoppers, true story, in Minnesota on the banks of Plum Creek, these grasshoppers just come down like a tidal wave. They are coming from everywhere, banging all over uh, houses, banging all over uh, all the windows. I mean, it is just coming down like a torrential rainstorm, but it's not raining water, it's raining grasshoppers, huge grasshoppers. She explains in her book, the cloud that was coming in was hailing grasshoppers. The the cloud was grasshoppers. Their bodies, listen to this, hit the sun and made darkness. That's how many grasshoppers were around her on this day. Their thin, large wings gleamed and glittered, and rasping and whirring of their wings filled the whole air, and they hit the ground and the house with the noise of a hailstorm. That's a lot of grasshoppers. Then she continues and said that she heard another sound, and this other sound uh, was the nips and snips and gnawing of the grasshoppers eating. You could hear it. They're just eating and eating and eating and eating. You could hear the millions of jaws biting and chewing day after day. These grasshoppers kept on eating and eating and eating and eating. They ate the wheat. They ate the oats, she said. And they ate every green thing, all the garden and all the prairie grass. The whole prairie was bare and brown. Listen to this. Millions of grasshoppers whirled low over it, not a green thing was in sight anywhere. Laura Eagles Wilder in her novel series literally uh, uh, etched this moment into like American literature, uh, literary history. This was a day she would never forget. 
And in the same way, Pharaoh is about to enter into a day that he would never forget, that the people of Egypt would always remember, and they would remember it so crystal clearly, and the nation of Israel would remember it so, with such precision and clarity that we would be preserved for thousands and thousands of years, and it would now enter into sacred scripture, and then we would then learn from the account of the plague of locusts. It was crazy. What a crazy day. So if you like to take notes and you want to take two points, they're very easy. It's the plague of locusts and the plague of darkness. How do you like that? Not very creative, but it is what it is, okay? And so join me in the book of Exodus in chapter 1, all of the, or chapter 1, we're not starting over. In chapter 10, verse 1, these, th- these plagues all start very similarly. They all have kind of the same routine. And, uh, and so it starts with Moses and God having a speech. God's given Moses a speech, and he's telling him some pretty strong words. In verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I've hardened his heart. We've heard this already. And the heart of his servants, that I may show, circle that word, show, that I may show these signs of mine among them. In this speech, God says there's a show that's about to go on. And the show are these signs. We've seen plague after plague after plague after plague now. And God has shown up in his might and in his power in a very, very unique way to show himself to Pharaoh, to Israel, and to the watching world. I'm here. God's here and God's on the scene and God's about to make some major moves. And here's what's crazy is God's done all of this and Pharaoh's heart, as we studied last week, has been seared. It's been hardened. His, Paul says to First Timothy, the conscience can be seared. Remember that? His conscience is seared. It's hard to be to, to, to press into, and his fate has been secured and uh, is helpless against the might and the power of God. And so, after all of these plagues, there's no excuses. His heart is hard, and he is turning his eyes from God onto himself. And God says, I'm showing up. And then there's this interesting little nugget in verse 2 that shows up that we haven't seen before. And we haven't studied before. Look at verse 2. And he says, I want you to tell some people some stuff. He says, and that you may tell. Everybody say tell. So we got show and tell right there, verse 1 and 2. We got show and tell. Uh, uh, Tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them. In other words, what God is saying to Moses is he's saying, I want you to tell the story of what I've done to your kids. Parents, it's your responsibility to disciple your kids in the ways of Jesus. I know that we drop your kids off, and let's be honest, we know it's more than an hour. We all know that. So we get, you get an hour and a half here at our church every week. Other churches, you get an hour, maybe less. But you get an hour, we get your kids for an hour and a half a week. And are we stewarding that environment as best as we can? You better believe we are doing that. But an hour and a half of Jesus a week is not enough. And so our job is to come alongside of you and to help you. And so that's why you, week in and week out, being in this room, hearing and sitting under the authority and the preaching of God's word, you're getting stuff you don't even know you're getting because the Holy Spirit is working on you and is going to carry over what happens in this room for an hour sermon. It's going to just seep all week long. And our job as parents is to kind of take like if our life is a sponge and what we're learning and soaking up in here, our job is to wring that out in our homes. Moms and dads, it's our job, it's our responsibility to tell our kids of the faithfulness of God and what God has done in our lives, what he's done in our family, what he's doing in our church, what he can do with the people who are faithful to him. Parents, it's our job to do that. God says, Moses, you better be ready because your kids are going to need to know this. He says it again to him in Deuteronomy in chapter 6, verse 20. When your son asks you in a time to come, what's the meaning of all these testimonies and statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Verse 21 says, then you shall say to your son, this is what God says, when we <laughs> tell him this, remind him of this. Son, here's what happened. When we were slaves in Egypt... And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders and great great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and his household before our eyes. We got to see all of that happen. And check this out. He brought us out of that. He brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. 
That is the power of the gospel. That God brought us out to bring us in. That's the story of Exodus. That's your story too. That God brought you out of your slavery to sin and brought you into a relationship with the living God. And parents, it's our job to tell our children the story of how God brought us out and brought us in to a relationship with him. We see that right there in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 2. That's good preaching. Whether you're listening good or not uh, is irrelevant uh, because it is what it is. Amen? Amen. Now notice this at the very end. He says, and we've seen this refrain all throughout these plagues, that you may what? That you may know. K-N-O-W, that you may know that I am the Lord. So God's been doing all of this stuff so that these people would know that God is the one and true living God. So that you can look upon all the miraculous hand of God as through all these plagues. And I know there's devastation, but uh, you can look at the power of God and you can say, surely there is a God. Surely there is a God and that you may know him as Lord. That's incredible. You see, God wants you to know him when you endure the deepest adversity in your life, too. These were not wasted days for Israel as they watched Egypt endure what they endured. To be honest with you, these were not wasted days in the life of Egypt as well. They had time after time after time after time to repent and turn to the Lord, and they refused to under the leadership of Pharaoh. But these were not wasted days. This was an opportunity to know God in a more full way. And I just want to say that this was one of those weeks for many people in the life of our church. Many people were walking through uh, some (laughs) plagues. I got a text message and somebody said, can we stop preaching about the plagues, please? Because I'm going through them right now. Let me just give you a little quick hit list of what happened this week in the life of our church. We had two wrecks, one that probably should have died, but the hand of God was protecting him. We had a funeral of a church member who their dad went on to be in heaven. Um, And then we had uh, several people in the hospital, a little kid who couldn't breathe, went into children's hospital. And Tyler and I were able to go visit them and pray over him. And then there was another young mom who's pregnant and had some crazy infection, and she was in the hospital. Then there was a fire in the dorm of one of our college students at UC that in the late into the evening they had to retreat and run. Heard about a flat tire this week. Anything else? Anybody want to pass a mic? Talk through what we're going through? For real, right? Like life is real. Amen? And this is an opportunity for you and for me to know God in a more fully, more faithful way than if we didn't walk through those things. Nothing that you're walking through today is wasted. I love what Psalm 119, verse 71 says. I like the message. I don't always reference the message, but listen to how plain he makes it. My troubles turned out for the best. Well, how did your troubles turn out for the best? They forced me to learn. (laughs) My troubles turned out for the best because they forced me to learn from your word. They forced me to learn who the one and true God is and how faithful he is. We've already sung about it. He was faithful then, and he'll be faithful now. That's the beauty and the power of following after the one and true living God, the God of Scripture. This is all going down in like two sentences in his speech with Moses. Like, we're we're turning the heat up, man. And as soon as God commissions Moses, we see something that we've seen in the life of Pharaoh with crystal clarity. But we see the severity of pride. The plague that Pharaoh, Pharaoh, (laughs) the plague that Pharaoh endured, probably greater than all of the natural things that showed up, was the plague of pride. Notice in verse 3 what happens. It says in verse 3, So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Anytime you see that, you ought to pay attention to what follows. Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews. Now listen to this question. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Like, how how long are you going to endure this? And maybe a modern paraphrase could be, is how dumb are you going to be? Like, like, Have you not seen the last eight plagues that have gone down? Or seven plagues that have gone down? We're about to go through eight and nine right now. Like, are you sure you're not getting this through your thick head? Somebody said this to me last week in the lobby. It's like, uh, hello, McFly, is anybody home? That's what it feels like, right? Like, how stubborn, how hard do you have to be to miss the hand of God? It is not 
secrecy. It is crystal clarity. Pride will get you every time, friend. Every time. And notice it doesn't change. The plan is to go serve. Do you remember what that word serve means? It means worship. I want my people to go and worship. And your pride's holding them back. And I'm going to refuse to let your pride hold them back any longer. And so when the pride gets intense, the plague gets more intense. One commentator said that the, since the they, the Pharaoh and Egypt, were unwilling to be humbled, they would now have to be humbled. That's scary. That is humiliated directly by Yahweh. Think about that for just a second. How humble do you, what is it? How long will you refuse to humble yourself to the Lord? Can we just ask that question directly to you today? To, to me, I had to wrestle with this too, so I'm giving you this now. How long are you going to wrestle with God in your pride and your arrogance? How long are you going to be stubborn and hard-hearted to the voice of God speaking his vision and plan and purpose for you? And you might think it's hard, but the first step's always hard in anything. But once you take that step of faith, it doesn't necessarily always get easier, but your trust is built in a God who will hold you, even if it's hard. How long are you going to remain prideful and arrogant and stubborn and hard-hearted? Pride's going to get us every time. And I, what, what would... It says that the Lord is going to humble him. How many want to sit under the hand of God's humiliation? One, two, three, not it. <laughs> not it. I don't want to sit under the heavy hand of God to humble and humiliate me. What's a better option? To humble yourself before the Lord. To humble yourself in submission to Him. I was reminded of that verse we've read many times here, but Second Chronicles 7. Now, I understand that Egypt is not Israel, but the principle applies. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Let me just pull back a second. Is that not what Egypt needed? Is that not what this nation needed? Was a leader who would humble themselves under the mighty hand of God and say, enough, I quit, I resign. You're the Lord, I'm under your leadership, and you do with me and with this nation that which you want to do, and we'll just follow. How crazy would that have been? That would have been powerful. But his pride held on, and then came the severity of the plague. Now notice before we dig into this plague here, that uh, we get this leniency again. God's being gracious again. Again. Just like show of hands. How many of you would have already given up on Pharaoh and the leniency has gone out the door? Anybody? A bunch of rude people. <laughs> Not very gracious. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't have either. I would have been done. I would have like signed, sealed, delivered, it's over, you're done. I'm done. Like let's do, let, let's nuke Pharaoh. Whatever we gotta do. This is not working. Look at verse four. We're moving on. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, there it is. What does it say? I feel like six people have their Bibles open. What does it say? Tomorrow. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. Tomorrow. Remember when you studied last week, tomorrow is a symbol of what? It's grace. It's God's leniency. It's his loving kindness to Pharaoh. He's giving him time saying, bro, you got the rest of the day to get this thing in order. And if you don't get it in order, then guess what's coming? Plagues. And they're coming with a massive swarm. Millions and millions. Let me just say it this way. Billions and billions of locusts upon your land. While, those, while, there's, while there is still time. The question is, is will he steward the grace or waste the grace? Well, if history is any indicator of what Pharaoh has done, we know what he will do. The question for you is, is will you steward this gracious moment that God has given you, or will you waste it? 
I can't answer that for you. But I think it's a serious question that we all need to wrestle with. Will we steward the grace God has given us, or will we waste it? Well, let me just jump into verse 5 here and notice these locusts. This is pretty gross. Not as gross as some of the others. Uh, And they shall cover the face of the land. What does that mean? It means they're everywhere. You don't need no Hebrew to know that. It's everywhere. So that no one can see the land. Don't you love how the Bible interprets itself? What does it mean to cover the land so that you can't see it? That's what it means. You know, again, you don't need a Bible degree to know that. You can just read it right there for yourself. Slow down and take time to read it. And they shall eat. There's some hungry little insects is what they are. They shall eat what is left after you, or after you, after you eat. Sorry. They shall eat what is left to you after the hail. That, that, and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. These particular bugs are called Schistocercara gregaria. You like that? Why we got to go there, man? They're just basically known desert locusts. I was trying to flex and show my intelligence, and I obviously don't have it. I had to phonetically spell it out in my notes in pencil so that I could say it remotely correctly. Not that smart. They're desert locusts, and uh, they are, uh, yeah, pretty gross. And uh, this is obviously zoomed in. Most scholars believe they were brown. Uh, it doesn't really matter what color they are, but they were brown desert locusts because of where they are. They're kind of green like grass locusts here. And they're huge. I mean, like that big. Big, 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 big locusts. Now, here's the crazy thing. Uh, this is not something that just happened in the Bible. We've had locusts show up all over the place. 1954 in Kenya, uh, this was one of the biggest locust outbreaks in Africa, and uh, this is, uh, let me just say, it, it's a thousand square kilometers. Uh, I think that's about, it's over a thousand mi- square miles. I know that to be sure. Uh, and rose almost 5,000 feet above the ground. 5,000 feet. Uh, the largest swarm was over 200 square kilometers and held approximately 10 billion locusts. It was large enough to cover the entire metropolitan area of London, England. And these bugs swarmed in for months. For months, they were just eating all of the vegetation that was in Kenya. And just, by the way, the bugs did leave. But guess what? The problems that the bugs created didn't leave. They left devastation in their wake. And this is the, and and as a matter of fact, it wasn't just felt for days, it was felt for years after. Notice what it says in verse, uh, what is it, uh, verse 5, it says that no one can see, uh, they'll eat everything that's left, they'll fill, verse 6, your houses and the houses of all of your servants and Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came out of the earth until now. And then he turned and he went from Pharaoh. So right here you see all of their food was destroyed. Now, some of you who are smart are connecting the dots. Wait a second. I thought everything last week was destroyed. Just look over your Bible. What what, what would be left? Do you remember that dumb little thing that Moses pointed out about the stupid plants that survived? Do you remember that? Wow, I wonder why that was there. This is why it was there. Look at chapter 9, verse 31. The flax and the barley were struck down. Cool. Thanks for the, the update on the meteorology update of the year. For the barley was uh, was in the ear, and the flax was in the bud. Now, those didn't survive because why? They were above the surface of the earth. They'd already had, uh, they was ready for harvest. Verse 32 says, but the wheat and the emmer were not struck down, for they are late in coming up. They haven't germinated yet. They haven't peaked up over the surface of the earth through the soil to produce trees, to produce oats, to produce wheat. So now we get a little time stamp here. Now we understand, ah, some time has come from the hail to now the locusts. Enough time for these plants to grow up above the surface of the earth and for them to have some level of harvest and have to have some fruits, to have some vegetation, to have some sustainability, and they felt hope. Don't you agree? Oh, man, we got some food. It didn't kill all of it. Oh, sorry, bro. If you're going to continue to make remain hard and stubborn, guess what's going to happen? The heavy hand of God's coming now, and all of those things 
all of those plants that were growing, all those now animal bellies that are full of all the extra vegetation that is out on the ground, it's all going away because your leader's stubborn, hard heart. And those locusts are now going to eat all of those things that were waiting to be harvested. Yeah, God's not really in control of the details, is he? Oh, no, he is. And then the Bible says, this is just kind of one of those crazy moments. Then he turned, Moses did, and he went out from Pharaoh. You don't get this, but this is the only way that Moses, this is the first time and the only time Moses leaves this way from Pharaoh's presence. He's kind of ticked. He's like, bro, if you're not going to get it, I'm out. See ya. I'm done. I am done. And the, the text is a picture of an about face, like a military about face. He turns on his heels and runs the other, not runs, he walks out the other way. I leave you with your decision. Good luck. Well, you can imagine what happens next. The sentence from heaven is dropped. And notice the hand that is raised right here, verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land, there it is, of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. Just a clear indicator of what's actually going down here. So Moses, what does he do? He stretches up. It's the picture. Oh, uh, wait, it says staff. One says hand, one says staff. It's this. Come on, people. This is what he's doing. He's raising both up in surrender, in a free will of God. Go take care of this and do what you will. So verse 13 says, Moses stretches out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land that day and all night. Can you imagine what these people felt? Think about it for a second. They just went through the literal storm of their life with all that hail, and they prayed, and all of it stopped. The lightning stopped. The wind stopped. The rain stopped. It all stopped. And now, a windstorm blows again. What is happening? A constant question of what is happening in our world today. That's what they're asking over and over and over and over again. So this wind is blowing all over the place. You can imagine, they're like, well, what's, what's about to happen? Can you? <laughs> Those people weren't in the room with Moses and Pharaoh. Moses knows what the wind's going to do. It's going to bring locusts. But these people have no clue what's about to happen. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. Now, some people want to get into a whole deal about where these people came, where these locusts came from. I'm going to give you my opinion on what this means. You ready? It's very easy. Jot it in the margin of your Bible. Who cares where they came from? It doesn't matter. Like, let's talk about the color of the locusts and where they came from and how old they were. I don't care. Because the end result is the same, whether they were little miniature baby locusts that grew up in the traveling time from the eastern side of the country of Africa, and then they made their way, or the western side, they made their way over to the east. Who cares? These little suckers were starving. And they were coming by the divine hand of God. He matured them somewhere else, sent them into this place, and said, have your way because of the stubbornness of this particular people. So who really cares where they came from? How long it took them to get there? Was there a storm? No, stop. We're done. It doesn't matter. And so, All of this is pretty interesting. I skipped a couple of things here. I'm sure you noticed that didn't really miss that. That's what you get. I skipped verse 7. Notice this real quick. I got to do it. You ready for a fast one? Here we go, verse 7. Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man snare uh, be a snare to us? Isn't it interesting, by the way? Quick little thing here that the snare, the trap, was Egypt over Israel. That was the real snare. That was the real struggle. And now, Israel was now a struggle for Egypt. My, how the tide has turned. Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not understand uh, that Egypt is ruined? So, uh, a little squabble here happening between Pharaoh's closest advisors. Before all this plague comes down, before all these uh, locusts swoop in, they're arguing as the, as the locusts are traveling. Let's just say it this way. As the locusts are traveling, they're arguing over, do you not see our city? 
you not see our nation? Have you not gotten word of, of what it's like out there with the piles of livestock, with the dead frogs everywhere, the smell of blood still around us? Like, do you not understand the destruction and ruin that is out there, Pharaoh? You need to open your eyes. You're operating in an insulated reality that isn't the reality of everybody else in our country. Which is what obstinate leaders do. They, they, what they do is they, they hold the line because they live in a different paradigm, in a different reality, because they're saved and protected from daily life down with the normal folk. When your dollars don't go as far as they used to go, when gas is $75 million a gallon, and your pantry isn't as full as it used to be, your bills are higher than they've always been, and you're literally going, what is happening? And then they go to the leader and it's like, no, it's really not that bad. To which Pharaoh's advisors would be like, bro, wake up. This is ruined. We need to let these people go because we can't handle it. So then that's when Pharaoh says, hey, guys, we need to do something. So then they argue with Moses, verse 8. So Moses and Aaron brought back to Pharaoh and said, go serve the Lord your God. And then notice what he says. I want you to go. Oh, but which ones are going? Who's actually going to go with you to serve the Lord? He says, well, um, just for clarity, like we've said the entire time, we will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and our daughters, our flocks and our herds, for we must hold a feast of the Lord. We're going to worship him. But he said to them, the Lord, now note, this is, in, this is dripping with sarcasm. Dripping with sarcasm. The Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil plan in mind purpose in mind. No, go, the men with you, just you and the men, serve the Lord, for that is what you're asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Hmm. Essentially, this whole thing is, um, okay, fine. So uh, if I send you out, then it's going to prove that God's hands all over this, and you have some evil intention in mind. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let your families go. I'm not going to let your animals go. Just go out into the wilderness. Do whatever you're going to do, like little tent, camp, whatever you're going to do, you're going to worship. I'm not going to let you go and just whatever. No, you're not going. And then that's when Moses leaves. He's driven out of his presence, and he sends a torrential wind by the power of God. Now, jump back to verse 16. Verse 16 says that Pharaoh hastily, after all this stuff blows in, hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I've sinned against the Lord and your God. Understatement of the series. Verse 17, now therefore forgive, now listen to this, this is great. Now forgive my sin, please, only this once. I've only sinned one time. And it was just this time. It wasn't any of the other times, just this time. It's no coincidence that this dies where I am, and I'm about to say this. Pharaoh hastily called and he said, please forgive me my sins, only this once. And plead for your God to remove this death from me. Interestingly enough, go on even more. So he went out and Pharaoh, uh, out from Pharaoh, and he pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord turned the wind into a very strong wind and lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left on the country of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly realized that this wasn't just inconvenience. This wasn't just gnawing. This just wasn't annoying that these locusts were eating all of their food. It wasn't just uh, something that they would learn to endure. What he quickly realized was what these locusts represented. He quickly realized that these locusts represented an end. It represented death. He knew that this was going to end in our imminent death. It's the topic that Paul told us about in Romans chapter 6. In verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Pharaoh was living out this reality that because of his sin, not just one, but all, and even if it was just one, it still was uh, garner, garnering the reward of death. For the wages of all sin, one white lie or murder, the wages of all sin is death. And he was feeling this gnawing in his own soul that this thing is going to end in fatality. I love what Douglas Stewart, how he connects the dots for us here uh, with Paul and with Roman, uh, with uh, Pharaoh, and he says this. 
He says, it is not that every sin leads instantly to death, but rather that every sin does not move the sinner, for it does move the sinner down further down the inevitable path towards death. Anybody recognize that? It's not that every single sin that you do, oh, now I'm dying. That's not it. What it does is it is a pathway that leads to utter destruction. When you go on a, what we I would like to call flesh trip, when you take a little fre- flesh trip and it's you compound errors in your life and you compound sins, they just start to snowball in your life and they get a little out of control and then you feel what? The weight of the destruction of the decisions that you've made because of sin. It's leading towards death. It's leading towards death. He says the ultimate punishment for sin in a universe created and sustained by a holy, omnipotent God is the extermination of evildoers. Do you understand that? That a perfect, omnipotent, and holy God does not exist where sin exists. That's why God isn't here and now. That's why he will create a brand new heaven and a brand new earth where there is no sin, there is no sorrow, because God and sin don't exist together. And Pharaoh is living out the reality of this end, understanding that the wages of sin is death. He's feeling the weight of, man, I have made these decisions. These decisions now are making me. The king of Egypt is, Stuart says, in his own limited way, and according to the basis of his own culture and beliefs, has caught a glimpse of this truth. Loved ones, that's what sin does like a locust. It just pounces, and it only knows one thing, to eat its weight in food all day long. And it's just going to gnaw and gnaw and bite and eat and eat and eat and eat and destroy your heart. That's what sin does. The design of sin is to feel fun, to entice you. That's what your spiritual enemy does, to feel fun, to feel enjoyable in the moment, and then it wreaks devastation. It it will wreck your soul. That's why the scripture says in verse 20, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He didn't let the people go. That's a natural reaction to someone who is going to give in to sin over and over and over and over and over and over. A hardening of the heart that will lead to death. But, did you know that there's good news on the other side of that verse? In Romans 6.23. Absolutely, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's a way out of escape. There is a way of escape from the gnawing, eating, devouringness of sin in your life, and you let Christ overcome that by his life, his death, and his resurrection from the dead. When you put your faith and trust in him, Ephesians 2 tells us that it is a free gift of God. His grace comes and meets us at our sin. We express our faith in Christ. We repent of our sins, and we're saved. And we don't have to live like Pharaoh did with a hard and stubborn heart. We get to live in victory because our sin is forgiven. So, the plague of darkness. It was August 1st, 1914, and Ernst Shackleton and his crew set sail from London, England, aboard a ship called the Endurance. Shackleton had a vision, had a life goal to traverse across Antarctica on foot and explore that continent from tip to tip. Novel idea, freezing reality. As they set sail, they were making their way. And you can imagine people with that kind of goal, that kind of drive. Explorers are pioneers living on the cusp and the cutting edge of life. And they're out there and they're fired up and excited about this journey that they're about to take. And midway there, the endurance gets lodged in between two icebergs. And they're shipwrecked. Now the goal of traversing across Antarctica suddenly changes. And it's now the goal of survival. I just got to survive. It was now, remember, January 
1914 is when they started. It was now January 1915. And at this point, it was all about survival. The crew faced so many hardships in these months to follow, including freezing temperatures, obvious starvation, uh, and then they faced what is called the long polar night. If all these other things in and of themselves would have been bad enough, but then it goes dark on you. It goes dark on you. Nothing was more disheartening than the long polar night. The sailors grew uneasy as the winter set in and the light began to fade. In May, the sun vanished altogether, not to be seen again until late July. Shackleton's biographer is recorded in saying that in all the world, there is no desolation more complete, uh, more complete than the polar night. It is a return to the ice age. No warmth, no life, no movement. Only those who have, have experienced it can fully appreciate what it means to be without the sun day after day and week after week. Few men accustomed to it can fight it off, fight off its effects altogether. And it has driven some men. Darkness can have a maddening effect on the human psychology. And there is no doubt about it that the darkness that Pharaoh and Egypt were about to face was going to cause them all to go crazy. If you pick me up in verse 21, you're going to see this whole thing come out, and it was out of the actual blue. The Lord said in verse 21, the Lord said, Stretch to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Now, I want you to notice this really quickly. Just jot it to the margin of your Bible. This is a darkness that was sent. Be very, very clear. Psalm 105, verse 28 says, David recounts the history of Israel, and it says that God sent darkness to the land so that they could not see. God sent this darkness. This was no raising of a staff. This was no praying that the darkness would come. This was God's power and might showing up that I am over and in and control of absolutely all things. And this darkness was sent. Also notice at the very end of verse 21, what was said. It was a darkness that's felt. What does it say right there? A darkness to be felt. Everybody say felt. It was a darkness that was felt. What do, you, what do you mean it was a darkness that was felt? So a lot of people want to say that this is enough. This is, I, I just love the ridiculousness that people do when they try to write about things that happened thousands of years ago. Uh, and like that they were there. I love that. I love that. It sounds like today. Our culture today, we like to make comments about things we have no idea about. I thought I was going to get an amen there, but that's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, this is a natural phenomenon, most scholars like to say, most liberal scholars who don't actually believe the Bible is the Bible. So, they would say, well, here's what, let me tell you what happened. Here, here's what happened. There's a big windstorm. Remember that whole locust thing? So, that whole locust thing stirred up the, the, the atmosphere. And the, stirred this atmosphere up, and then the, the first layer of dust in Egypt just kind of stirred up like a blender. And then that dust just magically arises into the air. It's like an eclipse. It just becomes nighttime. And then the dust just, you can feel it on your eyes. It was a darkness that you could feel. Blind. That's ridiculousness. Now, let me ask you a question. Are there dust storms? Sure. But if you're trying to explain away the divine by natural phenomenon, then you're really not looking to believe anything. This is not a natural phenomenon. This is divine darkness that was sent by the hand of God as a representation of the dark part that Pharaoh had and that everybody else had to feel because of their ridiculous view. This was divine darkness. And it wasn't about dust that you could feel. What does that word feel mean? Thanks for asking. Here's what it means. Several months ago, we uh, there was somebody that had a car accident hit a, uh, like a power line in a close to our house, and thousands of people one evening in Millville had no lights. You walk out into our neighborhood, and it's pitch black everywhere, except for the few smart people that had generators. They had generators in their hands. The 
Very few. And so what happened is that it was black everywhere. So what did Aaron do? He said, do this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find my phone so I can turn my flashlight on, and then I'm going to find lighters in our house so that we can light candles, and it smelled like Bath and Body Works times a million in our house with all the vanilla, pumpkin, coffee, latte, Mermaid Express. I mean, it was just all these smells. It was weird. And here we are just sitting in our living room, and it was starting to get hot and very uncomfortable, but it was this. You ever done that before? Anybody ever? Like, it's so dark in your house you can't see? The literal word here of felt is a picture of that. It's the idea of groping. I've, I, the only way I can see is by touching something to make my way into a space. It was so dark they couldn't make their way around, and the only way that they could make their way around is to feel their way around. It wasn't dust, bro. Like, that takes way more gymnastics to get to than just, hey, it was so dark they couldn't see they had to touch stuff to find out where they were going. You feel me on that? That was a really good fun. You feel me on that? It's a good fun. That was good. It was a darkness that they could feel. Now, there was an impact to this darkness. Look at verse 22. It says, so Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness. Everybody say pitch darkness. In all the land of Egypt for how long? That's a long time, friends. Darkness is a chaos word. Darkness is a chaos word. In Genesis, before there was light, there was darkness. And that word in the Hebrew, it means chaos. So before there was order in the universe and in the cosmos, I know this is going to be like a Bible class for a second, in order and in the cosmos, there was disorder. And when God spoke to the disorder, to the chaos, he created order in that moment, and he separated, guess what? Light from dark. He created light. And so right now, in this moment, here's something interesting. There is chaos ensuing in the land of Egypt. Mass, hysteria, and chaos. It is an uncreation that is happening, if I can say it that way. And here's what God is uncreating. The loyalty to false gods. The Egyptian god, Ra, R-A, is the sun god, said to be the god of all gods. Pharaoh is said to be the son of Ra. So guess what God's doing here? Yeah, your boy Pharaoh ain't nobody. And the whole Ra thing? Mm Mm-mm. Not Ra. Not not good. I'm over all of it. I'm over all of it. And you're feeling this this chaos right now? You want order? You run to me. Because Ra is not going to be able to do anything. Pharaoh's not going to be able to do anything. And by the way, he hasn't been able to do anything the last eight plagues. He ain't going to be able to do anything now. So this chaos comes. And then they experience isolation. No one could see one another. These people were laying on their floor in their living room for three days. You thought your lockdown was bad. This was horrible. Three days. Couldn't see their hand in front of their face. It's not like they could light a candle. Maybe some did. Maybe they could find that. We don't. We can't believe that they didn't try to figure something out. They probably did try to figure something out. But there was utter darkness. They couldn't leave. They couldn't see. And it was isolation. And there's also an implied fear here. Can you imagine living in darkness for three days? Think about it. If you, if all of a sudden, now, granted, we have modern technology. You got lights on your phone. I can turn my Apple Watch into a flashlight. I don't have to own Energizer batteries and a mag light anymore because you you have access to it twenty four seven on your phone. Uh, they didn't have candles or lighters or things like like they had some level of lighting, but it's not lighting like this. When nighttime happened, it was like lock down the city. We're going inside because darkness is unsafe. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, to live in confinement and darkness was a sign of punishment from a god. And let me just say this. God is speaking their language. They will know. This is divine punishment. But from the one true God. Not from Ra. Not at all. But could you, back to the could you imagine. Can you imagine for three days? Lockdown, darkness, utter darkness. 
can't see your hand in front of your face. Trying to, you're worried about your crops, <laughs> worried about your food intake. All of a sudden you're thinking, hold on, something in the natural order of life is gone awry. <laughs> something outside of, this is not a solar eclipse. Another example of some people think this is what happened. It's not one of these eclipse moments where it's just utter darkness. No, this is divine darkness that has happened. And in that moment, you're going to begin to feel that darkness. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to go, yeah, this is otherworldly. I have no idea what this thing is. And if we don't get this light back, our plants aren't going to grow. Then our animals aren't going to have any vegetation to feed off of. Then they're going to die. Then those animals are going to die. Then we're not going to be able to eat the animals or the plants. Then we're going to die. We're all going to die. For three days, the terror and panic that would be stirred in Egypt was unprecedented. You would also get sensory disorder. Why do you think they put people in solitary confinement when they're trying to break them? Why do you think the, uh, that when you get captured as a POW, I read the stories of, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, oh, gosh. Unbroken. Movie Unbroken. What's it? Louis what? Come on. Zamperini. Yeah. Zamperini. Uh, where, thanks for the help. So, um, when they put him, when he was in a POW camp, they put him in these tight, small, confined places that were dark. Why? To break their psyche. So that they would get social dysphoria. They wouldn't, uh, or uh, spatial dysphoria. They wouldn't know what's big, what's small, what's, what's, what's hard, what's soft. Uh, they, it would be psychologically distressing. The depression would be even darker. The fear would be even deeper. It's as if God knows what he's doing. It's as if God knows that he needs these people to get to the heart of the matter. Because it's at the heart of the matter where real darkness lives. Amen? It is. In the Bible, darkness is a symbol of sin, rebellion, refutation. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.19, the way of the wicked is deep darkness. The result of sin, Jesus says, is that men love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Darkness dwells in the minds of hearts and uh, minds and hearts of sinners. And Ephesians four eighteen says they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. That sounds a little too familiar. To disobey God is to walk in darkness. First John one six says, Job eighteen eighteen. Listen to this: the person who lives in darkness is destined to die in darkness. Job eighteen eighteen says. He is driven from light into darkness and is banished from the world. That's where darkness takes us. Utter separation from God. And boy, were they feeling that then. One commentator says, like all these other biblical texts, the ninth plague symbolizes spiritual darkness, the darkness that spread from Pharaoh's hardened, darkened heart. Because their leader led with spiritual darkness, guess what? They were all caught in the wake of that. The whole nation was impacted by that. Did you know it doesn't have to be that way, though? There's, these plagues are very tense, and I get it. But did you know it doesn't have to be utter darkness? That's really, really, really good news. That, yeah, we all live with sin, and there's a struggle with sin, and there's some of us are under the power of sin, but hopefully most of us are just be, uh, in, around the presence of sin, not struggling under the power of it. Notice what the text says in the very next verse, in verse, the second part of verse 23. <laughs> but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. It was normal. Israel was normal. They had water, they had food, they had order, not chaos. They had grace, not judgment. They had light, not darkness. So some would say, could have Egypt seen light? I think they could. I think that was part of the punishment. Looking over to Goshen and saying, what is going on over there? And why is there not going to be any light? Well, do you have any other examples of that? I do. Lazarus. When he was in, uh, not, uh, Laz, uh, Abraham's bosom, Luke's gospel. I don't have time to go there. It's a picture of Hades, and uh, and you can see it, and he's saying, if you could just go tell my brothers about what's real here. He was in darkness and saw light, and said, just go tell them the reality that hell is real and heaven is real. Make a decision now. 
New Testament example of St. Paul. Prophet Isaiah 46, 16 says, I will turn darkness before them into light and rough places to level ground. That's the power of the gospel. From dark to light. When Paul tells of his conversion, he says this in Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from Satan to God. That's what we do. There, there is hope. You can turn from darkness. You can turn from sin and turn to Christ. I was reading just this morning in 1 John, in 1 John 5, uh, 1, it says in verse 5, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if one, anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation payment for our sins, and not for us only, but for also for the sins of the world. That darkness has been paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You do not have to live in the darkness, but in the light as he is in the light. You don't have to go there, friends. You don't have to live under the judgment of God. You can live under the grace of God because of what Christ did for you on the cross. And all you have to do to receive that is confess Jesus as Lord, repent of your sins, believe on him, and you will be moved and snatched from darkness and brought into the marvelous light, which is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on, friends. Sin will eat you, but Jesus will save you. Amen? And that's the power of these plagues. They get into this whole war on who's going and who's not going. And now Pharaoh ramps up again in verse 24. Pharaoh called Moses. Apparently some light came and lasted three days. This must be day four. Go serve the Lord. Your little ones may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. Sometimes I feel like Pharaoh, again, is, what is he, building a zoo? I mean, what's going, like, why does he need these animals? He doesn't need animals. He's not farming. He doesn't care. What is it? Insurance policy. Power. He, people like to think that Moses is uh, just not telling the whole story about the Exodus, like, let us go. And he's kind of like nonchalantly saying, well, maybe just a few of us will go. We'll go for three days. Pharaoh fully understood through all the plagues what Moses was doing was polite negotiation. Moses was saying, I'm being kind. I'm trying to honor your authority. I'm in your land. But here's the deal. We're going, whether you like it or not, and we're going for forever. And it's me, my family, and all the families, and all the animals. Pharaoh understood the gravity of what the Exodus really was. And let me just say this, too, by the way. You think God preserved all those animals so that Pharaoh could keep them? Uh, no, sir. Not at all. These animals were preserved to worship God. And these animals were an integral part of the worship of God. So then Moses interjects, and it's like, no, bro, not happening. We're going to skip the no, bro section. It's verses 25 and 26. He says, not happening. Now notice what happens. The indictment falls again. Verse 27, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. To which we would all say, this is, on, this is, this is crazy. This is now borderline crazy. And then he does what all hurt people do. Hurt people hurt people. Pharaoh's hurt by his own sin, not by God. God didn't hurt him, he hurt himself. Notice what he does. Get away. Get away from me. Get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, okay. I will not see your face again. The irony in that statement is the next time he saw Moses' face, he would be drowning in the Red Sea. I've worked so hard to try to figure out for you practical examples for these plagues of what they mean for you. What are we to take away from this? 
sure you could look at Moses and how he was fearful about going into Egypt, and then now by chapter 10, the dude is as bold as they get. And we can learn to step into our calling and we'll be more bold. And feel stirred full of faith, like, yes, obviously we are going to ask ourselves, have we really truly, genuinely repented? When we could get confronted every week with fake repentance from Moses or from Pharaoh. Obviously, we're going to ask ourselves that. Yes, we're thrilled that Egypt, or that Israel was finally delivered from their slavery into the promised land by the hand of God. And God has absolutely delivered us from the power and clutches of sin into salvation. Yes, those are all awesome things. But as I sat this week, and we, we, Tyler and I, we talked quite a bit, Danny, we were all talking, and I don't think I've preached them wrong for you, but I think there's a greater point than all of that. Those are just natural applications of reading the Bible, but what's the real point? What would have been, and, and how do you determine what the real point of the Word of God is? It had to be the real point of the original audience, and the real point to the wandering generation in the wilderness when they would read this would be this. The real point is this. Look at God. How awesome is he? You see, sometimes we just need to be reminded of how big and powerful God really is. When you've got a week like I've had this week, you just got to look back and go, yeah, it is what it is, but God is incredibly powerful and God is sovereignly in control and I will trust him no matter what happens. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of how powerful, mighty, and strong, and committed God is, not to me, but to Him, and to His plan. And that's what these plagues are all about. So many of us, we, we say, well, what does this mean for me? And what do these plagues mean for me? And you know what that does, and I've taught you this term, but you just need to learn it again. You're narcissizing the Bible. Exegeting the Bible is to draw meaning out of the Bible. Narcissizing would be what? Reading myself into the Bible. Well, you're not Pharaoh. Sin is Pharaoh. You're definitely not Moses. Moses is a lesser Jesus. He's a, he's a type of Christ. And Moses defeats Pharaoh, who is sin. And Moses is like Christ. He delivers the people. And we are now free from the power of sin. That's the story. The story isn't how you can overcome. Yes, you can because of the blood of the Lamb. But it's not about you getting Christian motivation. It's about you looking at how powerful God is. I read in my Bible, I've got this ESV pastor's Bible, the book of Revelation. I was reading it as I was prepping for this funeral this week. And it's a quote from John Piper. And he says, give your people God. And that's what I came to give you today. And what I prayer, prayerfully try to do every single week is I stand behind a, a table or no table or a pulpit or no pulpit. And as I stand behind the word of God under the submission of God, I want to say, I have seen the face of God this week. I have heard the voice of God this week. Thus says God, here he is. Isn't he awesome? And that declutters all of the mess in our lives. Because the truth is, when you look upon God, you know what it does? It exposes our idolatry of what we really worship. So when we say, well, what does this mean for me? You're, 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 it's idolatry. I ran across this. Some of you maybe have read this. It is a uh, unbelievably timely, famous writing by Walt Whitman. It's called The Song of Myself. Listen to this idolatry. I celebrate myself. I sing myself. The song of me rising from the bed and meeting the sun. Divine am I inside and out, and I may hold whatever I touch. If I worship one thing more than another, it shall be my own. The truth of the matter is, is that you're not going to worship Ra, the sun god, but you have an idol in your heart too. You pay homage and admire your advancement. Some of us worship our pain. Did you know that? As you share your pain and the condolence that you give get from other people, it puffs your pride to make you feel better about yourself. 
Look at all the medications I'm taking, all the doctor's visits that I've had. Look what I'm enduring. That's sin. I robbed a share of the struggle. But if it puffs up your pride, don't you feel better about yourself when it's sin? We worship our children and our family. They're going to be great gifts when we go bad at odds. And when you come to a service like this and you get confronted with the judgment of God and the grace of God, the point is, is look how good God is. Get your eyes off of yourself. Stop thinking about you. Stop thinking about your struggles. Stop thinking about all the things that I've had to get through this week. Get your eyes off of that and look unto the Son. Look unto the Savior and see how glorious He is. Paul, Peter ends, concludes all of this better than I could. I'm just going to read it for you. When our hearts and our minds are imbued with a personal knowledge of our Creator, proper morality will follow. Our actions will flow from who we are at our very core. And who we are is determined by who we worship, whether God, the world, or ourselves. The plague narrative, indeed, the book of Exodus and the entire Bible, is a call to worship the true God. And it calls us to that goal by telling us who he is. The goal of these plagues is to, without fail, bold typeface, italics and underlines, who is God. He is the creator, sustainer, ruler, and reigner of all things. And we get our eyes off of all the other things and fix our gaze on Christ. And do you know what's fascinating? That's exactly what Israel did. As they leave in the Passover, as Egypt begins to chase them, as they walk through dry ground on the Red Sea floor and get to the other side, God commands them, build an altar, worship me there. And as they begin to worship, in Exodus 15, you will see that Moses sings. Miriam grabs that tambourine, a little Pentecostal woman, starts banging that little side of her hip, starts dancing, getting excited and getting fired up because look what God has done. Look who he is. Don't we know him better because of what we have now gone through? Psalm 105, David is recording all of the history of the nation of Israel and how they were preserved through the patriarchs, how they were preserved through Moses, how they now are enduring in a people that are alive and well even to this very day. And he then goes through this whole thing and says, how good and marvelous are his deeds and are his work. Let's know the Lord for he is good and his faithful love endures forever. Do you know what happens when you look at who God is? You are compelled to explode in what the Bible calls doxology. And doxology means worship. That's all it is. You are propelled by the, every fiber of your being to worship him, to look at him as holy, almighty, powerful, sovereign, ruler, and reigning. And you probably know it. And it's good. It's good. So, the response to the plagues, simply this. Know him better and praise him more. Know him better and praise him more. And that's what we're planning to do now. I believe you've gotten to know him better. But now, outside of this, get your eyes off of your stuff. Don't think about how this practically applies to you. It applies this way. Praise him. That's the application. Praise Him. Father, we love you.